Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this press conference from the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum in Davos 2016. You're joining the press conference that is trying to answer the question, how can we secure access to education for one million refugee children? Um, the topic uh, has, been, has been discussed for the last remaining three days here in Davos as well. It's very high on the agenda for obvious reasons. We all know about the urgency and uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to present an expert panel uh, to discuss that topic further today and trying to answer that question. So without further ado, uh, uh, let me uh, present the panel to you today. Um, to my immediate left, we're joined by Gordon Brown, who's the UN Special Envoy for Global Education. Um, we're joined as well uh, by Anthony Lake, the Executive Director of the United Nations Children Fund, UNICEF, based in New York. We're joined by Johannes Hahn, the Commissioner uh, for European Neighborhood Policy and Enlargement Negotiations of the European Commission in Brussels, by Sarah Brown, she's chairing the Global Business Coalition for Education, and uh, John Sexton, the President of New York University. And we're all keeping our fingers crossed that we're also being joined by Borger Brende, who's the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Norway. Um, Gordon, uh, over to you. How can we secure access to education for one million refugee children? Can, can I say, first of all, how honored I am to be on the same platform as uh, Commissioner Han, who has been leading uh, the European effort to help uh, Syrian uh, refugees and who has visited the region many times uh, to show his support uh, for action. And, and I'm very grateful that he's done so much. Uh, to be joined also by Tony Lake, who in every humanitarian crisis that I've ever seen uh, during the time he's been head of UNICEF has been at the lead uh, and I have a huge admiration for what Tony is, is doing and continues to do. And John Sexton, who's just retired as president of New York University, but is leading uh, a charitable effort to help uh, do more in the region in which uh, New York University is also active. Uh, and this is the first time I've appeared at the same press conference as my wife, uh, Sarah, and she's leading the business coalition. You know, today, the greatest humanitarian crisis since 1945 demands the boldest of responses and it demands that the broadest coalition of people, public, private, and voluntary sectors, act to do something. There are 60 million displaced people around the world, 20 million refugees, and Syria is today at the epicenter with the fastest growing problem, 12 million displaced persons, 4 million of them refugees, 2 million of them children. Within a year, that will rise to 2.5 uh, million or so. And two weeks from now, at the London Pledging Conference, organized by the United Nations, uh, we have a chance to do something uh, about this. And today, we are bidding to raise 750 million of additional money to fund one million school places that would cater for refugees who are now holed up in Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon without hope in many cases of education unless we do act. Europe has already, uh, with others, uh, combined offered 250 million. The World Bank is offering a loan of 200 million at least uh, an announcement is coming today from businesses who are prepared to support this. But if we are going to be able to give hope to these young Syrians who are becoming a lost generation unless we act, uh, then we need other donors to come in before February the 4th so that we can honor a promise I want to make to these refugees that in 2017 every one of them would be offered the chance of education uh, in the region in which they are living. Now what's unlocked our practical ability to do something about this is the introduction of double shift schooling amongst many other innovations uh, in which UNICEF particularly has been involved. Uh, with double shift schools where you operate the school for Lebanese children in the morning and for Syrian uh, refugees in the afternoon using the same classrooms, you can cut the cost of education to $500 per child per place. 200,000 are already in these schools in Lebanon and now we want to expand that system and other uh, innovations across Lebanon, Jordan and Turkey. Uh, so that we can cover one million refugee children by the end of the year. Working with UNICEF, Turkey plans to double its numbers, Jordan too will double its numbers, uh, and so too can Lebanon if the money is available. Now, there are very good reasons, as will be explained this afternoon, why we must act urgently. The average time that a refugee spends out of the country is many years, on average 10 years, and if we do nothing, thousands could go through education without ever uh, being could go through their school age years without ever being in a classroom. And I'm pleased that Borger Brende, the Foreign Minister of Norway, who has done so much, has joined us. And with us too is the Lebanese Education Minister. And I've just been talking uh, before he arrived about his 
Herculean efforts to get children into school. We know that rates of child labor are rising, child marriage and child trafficking rising. Uh, we know that without the provision of education, many parents see no choice but to leave the region and embark on what have become for many death voyages to Europe. But it's also well known that the one offer that we can make that will give young people most hope is the offer of education that allows them to plan and prepare for the future. So here at Davos, with the business community and many foundations present, we want to be clear there is no solution to the exodus to Europe without an expansion of education in the region. There is no solution to the rising number of child marriages and the exploitation of children forced into illegal labor in the region without the expansion of education. There is no solution to the rising discontent amongst refugees holed up in hovels and tents and camps without the expansion of education. And I call on the international community to use these next two weeks to respond uh, to the demand that there is that a million children be awarded the chance of education during the course of this year. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown. Director Lake, UNICEF is at the heart of, of helping, uh, of all these efforts, helping children. Please share your perspective on the subject with us. Uh, how, can, how can we uh, secure access to education? Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, let me begin, uh, first of all, by thanking Gordon, who is a, a true hero, and I use the word advisedly, of this whole effort to get more kids into uh, school, especially those affected by conflicts and crises. If I could put it just for a second in a global perspective, uh, there are 30 million primary and secondary school children uh, around the world out of school in conflict and crises. 30 million, that's almost half of the kids out of school, and yet uh, less than 2% of dedicated humanitarian spending goes to education. Uh, so this is a global challenge, but of course it is focused uh, on Syria and the surrounding uh, countries. You'll hear lots of numbers. Uh, First of all, to pay tribute to the host countries uh, who have already uh, put so many children into school. Um, in Lebanon, as Gordon mentioned, 200,000. In Turkey, 275,000. And yet, in both of them, we have at least twice that number uh, who we have to get in, uh, preferably by the end of this year. You'll hear lots of numbers. There are lots of numbers. But those numbers, each of the numbers that we have mentioned is an individual child. And that child now has already probably lost two or three years of education, which are going to be very hard to recapture. That means that the future of that child is in jeopardy. But the fundamental fact is that those children are the future of Syria and, uh, and to a large extent, the surrounding countries. If we do not get education, and counseling to these kids who have suffered so incredibly much, who have seen things that no child uh, should ever see, uh, if they grow up thinking that that is normal, if they grow up without the education that they need in order to someday help Syria recover, and if they grow up not just with education in their heads, but healing in their hearts, then we are going to replicate in the next generation the same horrors that we are seeing in Syria and the surrounding countries and now beyond uh, that we are seeing today. So the world has a, an extraordinary humanitarian obligation to help these children, and it is deeply in the strategic interest of the world to do what Gordon is calling for and put one million of these kids in school by the end of this year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director. Commissioner Hahn, I can't think of a topic that's higher on the agenda of the European uh, Commission and the European Union uh, than the refugee crisis. Um, please share your perspective from a European, from a Commission uh, point of view. Thank you very much. Uh, but first and foremost, I would like to thank uh, everybody here at the panel, in particular uh, Gordon Brown, for uh, their restless and, may I say, successful uh, activities uh, in order to help uh, indeed those uh, children in need. Uh, the European Union has uh, already mobilized together with its member states close to 5 uh, billion euro since the start of the Syrian crisis. Um, half of it is uh, from the European budget and uh, out of this uh, 1 billion uh, is a humanitarian budget. Uh, altogether we have mobilized around 500 million euro for education, uh, and this is something we have 
to further improve. I would be happy if we are able to double. We are working hard on it. It's absolutely necessary. In the run-up of the London conference on the 4th of uh, February, we are also working on a compact for Jordan and Lebanon and uh, on the Turkey facility. Uh, there are many creative means to cope with this major refugee situation. It's, for instance, also to provide jobs and not only to provide shelter and everything, which is a kind of reaction. We have to help them to get jobs because it's so important that uh, refugees can stay in the really proximity in order to move back as soon as this is possible. Uh, and as it was already said, there is a real risk to lose a whole generation of young Syrians who are being deprived of proper education uh, opportunities, and this will definitely limit their prospects and their perspectives in life. And uh, this is another risk. Yes. And they are targets of uh, extremism. We should be fully aware about this. Uh, so therefore, in any case, education will remain a key focus for the Union. We will spare no efforts uh, to bring back to school all Syrian refugee children uh, in the school year 2016-2017. This is our common aim. This is our common goal. But uh, probably the more challenging is to deliver assistance to those inside Syria. Uh, but their needs are no less important. There are two million out of school children inside Syria who need our help. Access to education is a complex issue, and it is not only a matter of funding availability. As it was already said uh, by Gordon Brown, it's also about the protection of children, for instance, from early marriage. We need political will from all concerned, including also the host countries, to address these issues. The London Conference is a timely occasion uh, to pledge support, but it's also about assess uh, the medium and long-term needs. Ultimately, what uh, Syria needs, and also this should be said in this context, is a political so solution. We need to start thinking of modifying our support to a post-conflict scenario. I've understood this was already uh, discussed uh, today in different settings. It's about the reconstruction of Syria. We need to provide incentives to today's refugees so that they can be the architects of Syria's future. Also, this is therefore a very good reason to offer them opportunities to stay in the region in order to return as soon as possible back and to work on the reconstruction of the country. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Commissioner. John, you've been leading one of the most prestigious ed, uh, institutions of higher education. How optimistic are you that maybe in 10 years from now or in 15, we'll be seeing Syrian refugee children graduating from New York University? What's your perspective on the issue, please? Well, first, let me, uh, let me say how honored I am to be on a panel with four people, uh, five people, and now that we've been joined by the great efforts of Norway, uh, that I admire tremendously. Uh, I'm, I, I'm really the the, the minor player in the piece. I'm just a teacher, uh, but uh, your, your 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 question is uh, is is well taken. Think about it for a moment. Uh, 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 what do parents want for their children? Uh, the most central part of the answer to that is education. Uh, people people care about hope for their children, and parents understand that education. Is, uh, is central to hope. Um, I join, I think, my fellow panelists that have spoken already in saying that uh, uh, Gordon, to me, is a hero. Uh, I don't think there's, there is a couple in the world that approaches the dedication to this issue that Gordon and Sarah bring to it. And I admire them, and they've caused me to say I'm going to dedicate a good part of my life to making sure that the answer to your question is affirmative, in fact, that we do far better than that. Uh, the Prime Minister and I will be announcing soon the creation of an entity that will dedicate itself to, uh, to this worldwide. But the focus today is on Syria and uh, the Syrian refugees, especially those in the three host countries that have been described. Why? Because uh, 
this is not a question in the three host countries any longer of capacity. Thanks to the ingenious double ship idea, uh, we, we have the facilities. Uh, the teachers, trained teachers, uh, the janitors, the security guards are all in the refugee camps as well. Uh, in other words, the capacity is there because uh, Syria had a strong education system before the conflict. Uh, so uh, all that's needed is, is will by those of us that can provide the resources. And we can get the one million children in. Uh, the piece that I can add to it that responds directly to your question uh, is a willingness of higher education to take the product that will be produced if only we can get primary and secondary education to these kids. Uh, I am the non-executive chair uh, of a university called the University of the People. Uh, in its normal template, the University of the People uh, provides uh, immediate access to a free university education, a quality university education to all students that are high school graduates, have access to the internet, are fluent in English, and are poor. And, and this is not some mass online effort. It's, it's uh, individual classes that looks much like the schools that we attended with courses and grades and volunteer teachers and so on. Uh, and the University of the People will take that general program into Syria. We've already created what we call the Emergency Refugee Assistance Program, which is prepared to take completely on scholarship uh, 500 students into business administration and computer science. We can do this tomorrow. And I can also add to that that as the students go through the program, there are universities like uh, NYU who are prepared to say, if at the end of the first year you're in the top 50 students, the top 10% of the class, we'll take you into our universities and provide you with the scholarship aid to continue in our universities in situ. Uh, we're also at the University of the People uh, beginning an initiative designed to create parallel courses to the English courses we'll offer in Arabic. And we, we, our goal is to take 12,000 12, Syrian refugee college students over a 10-year period. Uh, they'll take some of their courses in English along the way as we try to make them bilingual. The fourth year will be completely in, uh, in, in, in English. Uh, but they will graduate, whether they remain in the host country, return to Syria, or relocate elsewhere. And in addition to that, there are universities like NYU who are prepared to take qualified Syrian students tomorrow. And, and, and if we can find them, we, we will bring them, whether it be to NYU Abu Dhabi, or to NYU Shanghai, or NYU in New York, and we will provide them with the education they deserve. Thank you, John. Uh, Sarah, you're chairing the Global Business Coalition for Education, so I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot and, and ask you, we have about 1,500 corporate leaders here in, in Davos for the annual meeting. What should their role be? What can they do to th support these, these efforts? Thank you. Well, we've certainly heard about the scale of the problem and the urgency of it and the necessity to act. We've been working with the Global Business Coalition for Education for a while now with a lot of the big established global businesses who are your members are and are here today and this week but also with some of the newer businesses and the emerging technology companies. What I'm very proud to announce here um, at this press conference is that the GBC Education members have the first 50 companies who have come together to make their commitments um, to go directly for providing new uh, opportunities for education for Syrian refugees uh, wherever they're finding themselves in their new temporary home. Um, and that in advance, we're, this is just at the beginning, because obviously we're moving on next week to the Syria Donor Pledging Conference next week. So we'll be collecting. So my message to the other companies that are here is that they can join in with commitments. And these aren't just commitments for cash. We have $50 million of cash that we've collected so far, and that number is growing. But there's also an enormous uh, amount of in-kind skills and advisory uh, roles that companies can take. Um, uh, issues around technology, content, connectivity, logistics. 
these are all really important. I'm really pleased that Minister Enes Bussab is here, uh, who's the Education Minister in Lebanon, and I've been out and visited schools uh, with him and seen there, and the practical issues that are there on the ground is that the governments there in uh, Lebanon, in Turkey, in Jordan, are opening up the schools as quickly as they can and accommodating Syrian refugees working alongside the, the children of that country and being able to study there. But you see the practical skills that are needed, the safe school journey to and from school, the opportunity for schools to be connected, to be able to bring in tablet learning, supporting teachers, and also to make sure everyone has a, a decent meal that day too. Um, so all of these are challenges that come together and there's a really important role that the private sector can play. We've talked a lot now and I've been at meetings here at the World Economic Forum over, over the years where we know that there is a critical role for business to play. And we know that governments can't do it alone. These are some of the things that are said year in, year out. But I think we're reaching a moment now with the very, very strong themes at Davos around protecting the planet and investing in humanity. That really, really opens up the opportunity to business to roll up its sleeves, get out its checkbook, but also use all those other skills that they have from the trained human resources they have amongst their workforce to, to figure this out and actually get every child into school. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, Borger, you joined, you joined the panel uh, late, but Norway is usually among the countries moving first on these issues. Mm -hmm. So yeah. please uh, share your perspective. What is, uh, what is Norway doing to, to, to help us solve this crisis? Thank you, and apologies for being late, but uh, Elias, um, the Minister of Education of Lebanon, and I have a uh, perfect excuse because we were waiting for you at a totally different place. So we <laughs> ran here uh, like crazy from the other side of the conference uh, center. So uh, we were on time, but not at the right place, <laughs> um, unfortunately. But Sometimes again, uh, thank you for, uh, to Gordon and, and Sarah uh, for making uh, this happen. As you know, uh, we are extremely committed uh, to education in general. We will double uh, the ODA that we are allocating to uh, education by uh, 2017. Uh, we have initiated the Commission on Education, uh, looking at what is the cost of inaction, like we did in the health sector um, uh, during uh, Dr. Brundtland's uh, leadership. This is headed by uh, Gordon. Um, and we are very, very much now focusing also on the London Conference, where our Prime Minister has taken the leadership uh, together with Chancellor Merkel, uh, Prime Minister Cameron, and the Emir of Kuwait. And we would like this conference to deliver something very substantial uh, on education. There are 2.8 million Syrian children out of school. We're talking about a lost generation, lost hope for this country. Even if we now get, if we, if we are able, under Stefan de Mistura's leadership, uh, to get a peace deal, a peace agreement, um, there will be no future for Syria, even with that, if there is no education for the children, because then we would and will lose out uh, a generation, uh, on a generation. This, this has to be changed. That's why we need to also see a major stepping up, also in the field of education at the London uh, Conference. Our Prime Minister will come with a substantial major uh, pledge at the London Conference. I'm not authorized to uh, <laughs> share uh, with you um, anything uh, more than this, but we are working, of course, very strategically with uh, different head of states and head of governments now coming. So we will make sure that there will be a huge step up from Kuwait uh, last time, and this is needed. Uh, and I say uh, when uh, we're in a situation where the UN lacks 50% uh, of the resources that is needed in the neighboring country, in Syria, and we know the access challenges in Syria, there is only one thing to do, it is to step up, and we uh, are willing to take this leadership, but also in the field of education. It is unacceptable with 2.8 million Syrian children out of school. It is appalling, and we cannot leave this as a legacy uh, from our side. It is a political uh, responsibility to make sure that this is not happening. Thank you.
Thank you, Borgo. Director Lake, I think you want to uh, react to that? Before you go, I just wanted to, uh, two small, or two not so small points. Uh, one is just to thank uh, very much uh, Gordon and the EU, uh, Norway, uh, the UK, the US, and others for their support for the No Lost Generation Initiative, which is a common initiative among all of us, which has already reached within Syria with some educational help, a million kids, and outside Syria, over half a million uh, kids. It's a start. We have so much more to do. The second thing is there have been a number of references to the need for peace and putting an end to this conflict. And I wanted to mention that last evening, uh, I joined uh, almost 130 other heads of humanitarian agencies in a joint appeal that we're putting out over social media for both an end of the conflict in support of the talks, uh, but also an appeal for access uh, to uh, uh, besieged and other communities, uh, not only with health, but education and other uh, interventions, uh, to call for an end to attacks on schools by all parties, uh, and especially to call, uh, as I said, for an end to the conflict. Uh, and you will see this uh, uh, going out over social media. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to the panel. We have now uh, time for some questions. Uh, let's open the floor. If I can see a show of hands, and if you could state your name and organization for the sake of our online audience as well. Yes, please. Larry Elliott of The Guardian. Does the state of the global financial markets and the fragile state of the global economy generally make it more difficult to raise the sort of money you need to put these children in school? Well, uh, I mean, uh, as you can see, it's not always easy to raise the money and uh, I will um, follow what the Norwegian Foreign Minister has said. I think it's uh, important uh, to convince uh, also our member states and in particular finance ministers what it means uh, to finance uh, the costs of refugees being in Europe or to finance the cost of uh, refugees being in the environment or internal displaced. And it's also a humanitarian task uh, that uh, we have to help them to stay in the region. Uh, but I, I would say um, this is uh, for the moment, uh, the most urgent issue. I personally wouldn't believe that uh, the, the tough uh, economic situation is decisive, uh, but uh, of course there are often very uh, narrow national um, um, assessments, and uh, therefore I can only urge to act also in this respect uh, uh, as a European Union. Uh, and. Uh, to abstain from individual um, <coughs> activities and, uh, and initiatives. It's important to contribute, but it would be a great mistake to believe uh, that uh, this uh, problem can be solved by any individual country. It's a global problem, and it has to address globally, and therefore, once again, grateful for this initiative and whatever we can contribute, we'll do. I'd like to just add a, a, co a comment the social science data is overwhelming that investment in education leads to savings over time. So uh, anyone that can move beyond the short-term thinking that sometimes characterizes our politics, I'll concede, would see that this is a wise investment that will, even if judged narrowly on cost, be benefited. Just speaking from the perspective of the Business Coalition members, the money that seems to be coming towards education and towards investment in Syrian refugees seems to be going up. We're getting pledges coming in from businesses that are rising, not falling. I can't speak for what that will do as against what the markets are doing, but I think the investments into CSR more broadly are becoming much more sophisticated and therefore more substantial, and I think this falls within that scope. L let me just say one thing. Uh, the Norwegian Foreign Minister uh, uh, arrived late but is having to leave. And I want to acknowledge that Norway is now the global leader in education. It has not only set up the Education Commission, it is doubling its education aid. aid. And this is to the credit of the Prime Minister, uh, Mrs. Solberg, but also to the credit of the Foreign Minister, Borger Brandy, who's led the way. So I'm very grateful. 
<laughs> I, I also uh, thank the Guardian, uh, Larry Elliott of the Guardian. The Guardian ran an appeal for refugees at, at Christmas, Syrian refugees at Christmas, and it's to their great credit that they've led the way on this as a, as a, as a newspaper. But I just say, Larry, to do nothing or to do too little to help refugees in their hour of greatest need in probably the greatest um, uh, crisis of humanitarian aid uh, that we now face since the Second World War is a recipe for instability for the future. Uh, so whatever difficulties we have in the financial markets and whatever difficulties individual governments have with their aid budgets, I think we've got to recognize that in this, uh, this great humanitarian crisis, we need to come together because inaction is going to be a recipe for discontent within the region, a further exodus of people in greater numbers uh, to, to Europe, uh, and is going to lead uh, to uh, disc discontent, of course, amongst the young people uh, themselves. I it's very important that we recognize that to do nothing is a recipe for instability in the future. Thank you very much. Director Lake, please. Um, just I've, I've already heard um, today from a number of uh, meetings of business leaders, uh, government and others, uh, who are saying, and this is just common sense, who are saying that not only the growth in economies uh, over the next generation, uh, but also political and uh, other forms of stability, as Gordon was saying, over the next generation, depend on an expanding middle class. Uh, and by definition, you cannot do that by, without one, education, uh, and two, especially focusing in education on the most disadvantaged, so that you're expanding it. Uh, and who is more disadvantaged than the refugee children who are being denied access uh, to education now? So this is deeply in the strategic interest, not only of governments, uh, but of businesses as well. So briefly, I think we should be aware investment in education everywhere in the world generates the highest interest rates. This also at the address of uh, economic people. Thank you very much. Um, are there any further questions? Because if not, mindful of the far advanced time and the full schedule of our panelists, I would uh, close the panel here. Thank you very much for joining. And a special thank you to all of our panelists here today. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman.